This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 29, Episode 2. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. Are you ready for me to unpack what the big show is all about this week? All set. Okay. Coming up on this week's episode, we're going to review Ubuntu 13.10. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've been building toward this all week, and we've got some interesting thoughts on that. Plus, in the news segment, we're going to take a look at Cinnamon 2.0. Just hit the interwebs. Exciting. Nice. Yeah, it, Yeah, it is looking really good. Plus, HP might be going to war with Microsoft. This what? is huge. It is huge. And, of course, there's some very interesting Steam news, especially for those of us in the Seattle area. So oh, yeah. looking forward to talking about that. But, Matt, yes. as is tradition here on The Big Show, we like to start with our picks. That's right. Our app picks. How we roll. Something you can use on the Linux desktop. Mm-hmm. And then also we like to do a weekly spotlight now where we go through something that we think maybe just deserves a little extra moment of your time to for consideration. Yeah. All right. So I will start with uh, something that was really grinding my gears this weekend. Uh, so intended? <laughs> hey oh, <laughs> good point, good point. So Mercedes, driverless mm-hmm. car, runs Linux. Right. Now, Matt, I I am ready for our robot controlled well, cars. And and see, I think you're you're actually welcoming our benevolent overlords oh, yeah. where I'm a little more gun shy about the whole oh, yeah. Skynet driving me around town thing. I, I don't sure. know. You sure. Know, maybe I, this will no. ease your maybe okay. this will ease your Make concerns. Imagine a future where the cars drive themselves and it's powered by Linux. That's a good start. So the onboard computer runs Linux. Nothing too new there. I sure. actually think so I'll play I'll play a little clip yeah. of this uh, Mercedes Benz uh, autonomous long distance drive video. And if if you're an eagle eyed viewer of the video version, you'll spot a little Linux in there, so stand by. We did not just pick any route, but a very special one. The route where Bertha Benz made history 125 years ago with the world's first overland drive. The challenges were enormous. From the smallest streets and little villages to big cities, we had everything. So they have an onboard computer there. You can see running XFCE, and then really here's cool. their. De- they just show it real quick in their studio where they're designing it. They're running Unity on Ubuntu. Some of the laptops where they're mapping things out running Ubuntu Unity. Some are running XFCE. Here's another Unity shot. Look at all this Linux. You, and the really hardcore engineers are running XFCE. You know, you know, you know the, the real hardcore guys. You know, I'm just saying. But I think it's cool. I'm looking at this, and I, I thought this. Okay, so here's why I thought this fit really well with this week's show is. Right. We're going to get into the Ubuntu 13.10 review, and um, something has been happening that is sort of one of those things that just is organic. We're not even really fully aware of it until it happens, and that is Ubuntu has seen a lot of grassroots implementations in large organizations, and we'll get into that more later in the review. But here's an example of just, it, it's to the point now where it's just casual usage, like, right. oh, we have some engineers, they need some computers. Yeah, we'll put Ubuntu on that. Yeah, because it's going to do everything they need to anyway. It's, it's kind of incredible. We're at this stage now where it's, it's it's happening so much that we're not even talking about it anymore because it's just it's just everyone's rolling it out. It's almost expected, I think. It's kind of crazy. It is really, really kind of like the new age yeah. of uh, of Ubuntu. Um, so we'll we'll talk about that more towards the review. But that I thought this video kind of highlighted that because it's like, wow, look at that. Even you know, guys over at Mercedes are running this stuff. They're building the future of their autonomous vehicles using Linux, and that's pretty crazy. Well, and I think it's also interesting if you look at the locale situation, it seems to be, uh, I, that looked like maybe it was uh, Germany or something like that, yeah. um, you know, somewhere in that region, I would imagine, based on Mercedes. So um, it, it's interesting that, you know, they went to Ubuntu. It would be interesting to see how, like, maybe if Toyota was doing something here locally, would they do the same, or would, would you see them running Windows boxes? I don't think I, so. Because I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, a, a breaking point between, you know, the U.S. and the rest of the planet in that we're so... I don't know, so Microsoft shop here. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I hope it's changing. Now, that is changing in education here in the States, but I think that I I, I want to see more progress on the uh, enterprise front. We'll keep an eye out for it, man. Um, I'll tell you, though. Okay. So we were mentioning how you're a little worried about autonomous cars. I'm I'm totally right. But it's running Linux. I feel a lot better with that. I feel like humanity has had their chance to show that they can drive, (laughs) and now that we've gotten really crowded, I, I think it's I think we can also agree, or on record saying... We just, as a species, are incapable of driving. It's just not incapable of driving effectively. Individually, yes. Especially on the open road. (laughs) Woo, boy, man, can we drive. But I'll tell you, yesterday, Matt, I sat for 15 minutes in traffic while while some gal was driving a van and blocked two lanes. And she could have pulled all the way in. She just didn't. She chose not to. And I just sat there waiting, leaving from lunch to come back to here to prepare for this show. I just sat there tapping my fingers while I thought, why doesn't she pull forward? 
if this was all computer controlled, we would already be moving down the road. And and I tell you, I look forward to like just sitting back with my tablet, I get my 4G connection on, sure. browsing the web while my car takes me to wherever I go. Well, and if you're already running Ubuntu in your car, theory says maybe you're running Steam as well. You oh, know. see what I'm saying? Snaps. Feet up on the dashboard. You don't care. She can do whatever. Oh <laughs> man, <laughs> you're rocking your you're rocking your new, uh, new controller. Steam controller. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, don't let me forget. During the uh, break, we'll uh, show off the video to the oh, uh, live yes. stream of the new Steam controller. Yeesh. So a uh, big show today coming mm-hmm. up, and we got a we got a great live audience. They're uh, they're crushing our live stream right now. It's still catching up because there's so many people tuning in to catch nice. the Ubuntu 13.10 review. So if you'd like to join us, we have a lot of great episodes of Linux Action Show coming up over the next several weeks. So better time than ever just come over to jblive.tv mm-hmm. 10 a.m pacific over and oh by the way by the way we've yes. mentioned it but it's always been at the end of the show new calendar page over jupiterbroadcast.com oh, yes. slash calendar auto converts to your local time zone so if you just okay. want to see what time the show's live go to that page it'll auto convert for you and then you can hang out in our irc okay. where they're uh, going along with us we also have jblive.info for the audio stream nice and no more time math i mean how cool is that i you know what i I personally am ready to throw out the whole time thing, but I realize yeah. I'm ahead of the trend on that one. So, <laughs> Speaking of something else that's ahead of the trend, that's Yeesh. our first sponsor this week, GoDaddy.com. Yeah. So, you know, GoDaddy.com has been rocking this show 199 code, which gives us a $1.99.com, which is just, I mean, that's fundamentally awesome right there. And I there. keep taking advantage of it. I, I keep oh, coming yeah. up with these great domains. It's like, ooh, oh, I shoot. need to totally get that, right? I totally forgot. So, you know, when it's $1.99, it's like mm-hmm. anything I've ever needed to solve a right. problem with. So we have the, uh, I was just talking about the live stream, right? We have this live stream where folks can uh, suggest titles, and then we all vote at them at the end of the show, mm-hmm. and whichever one's kind of way up at the top usually become our title. But you had to go to this long URL to do it. So I went over to GoDaddy. Maybe it was even during Unplugged. I can't remember. And uh, I just registered jbtitles.com. Oh, for right? $1.99. Right? I mean, it's like, pfft, and it's one of those, why didn't I do this? But yeah. I know. It just makes yeah. my life so much easier. Now, I haven't actually pointed it to where it's supposed to go sure. because I bought it and then I kind of forgot about it. Well, yeah, you got other stuff going on. But, but the great thing is, is it's easy to do when you're ready. So this mm-hmm. is uh, this is probably the second point about GoDaddy. It, uh, show 199, I mean, that's all the reason you need right there. But GoDaddy is sort of going through a transformation to empower small businesses. And as a it small really business are. owner myself, I tell you, I would never buy a domain anywhere else. And there's a mm-hmm. really good reason for that. I love the fact that I can set something up and then I can delegate it off and I can kind of stand back and say, okay, whoever's responsible for this, it's yours now. And I don't have to give them my log and I don't have to give them my password. It really makes collaboration in a small business environment where every minute matters. Even even the time it takes for me to email somebody to Mm -hmm. tell them how to do it, that time matters. GoDaddy makes all of it so streamlined. I have folders set up where different people have rights to them. Oh, okay. I just so they create the a user and then you assign. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. So they That's they create cool. their own yeah. account. So they have their own domains. I like that. Everybody has a GoDaddy account because they yeah. are the world's number one domain name registrar. And then I just move the domain that they need to manage into their that's folder, fantastic. and I'm done. And I'm done. I just walk away. I say, thanks, and you can manage it now. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I mean, GoDaddy makes collaboration a snap or a kick, as uh, Jean-Claude that's might right. say. And, of course, with the uh, special offer code SHOW199, you can get a .com for $1.99. Additional years, $9.99. Additional .coms, $9.99. That's still a fantastic Very deal. reasonable. Yeah. GoDaddy, longtime sponsors of the Linux Action Show because they really understand that you guys are exactly the type of audience they need to target. And also, they love supporting the Linux community. And I've been uh, running them for some of my sites, and they continue to be flawless. I, I'm just really impressed with the experience I've had. I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking, man, if I'd just done this a long time ago, I'd save myself a lot of money. Word to that. Yeah, yes. word to that. So thank you very much to GoDaddy for sponsoring Linux Action Show, and a really big thanks to you guys for going out there, using that code SHOW199. I'm not sure it might exp- expire at the end of October, so if you have a holiday event coming up, something for your business, something for your yep. work, anything, something you just need to make easier for yourself, like if you have some stuff pointed to your home domain, Put a nice .com in front of that. Go use the code SHOW199 when you check out and you get your .com for $1.99. And thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring mm-hmm. the Linux Action Show. That's right. Time is now. You know, get on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kick it up a notch. That's right. Matt, I wanted to do a little Terminal 11. Oh, a little and Terminal 11. All sometimes right. these terminal picks that we have for our Linux app pick are real serious. You know, they're, they're, Yeah, they're very uh, task-specific. Check your sure. I.O. stats. Mm-hmm. What's your processor doing, right? That kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Uh, this week... I wanted to celebrate the terminal in more of a fun way. Oh, okay. And now cool. everybody knows that's watching this show. If you open up the terminal, you're obviously a hacker. Yeah, and we you're, all know you're all a hacker and you're all business. Yeah. Right. You're just you're just a and maybe you have a mask, a, an AK-47. You know, you're a, you're a terrorist. That's right. So you know? let's make it look good. I figured. Right. I mean, if we're going to be all be labeled as hacker terrorists, 
I say we make it look good. Well, so, and, and the comical thing about that is, in reality, all a terminal is is it's like a mullet. You know, <laughs> it's a party in the back and it's business up front. That's very true. And we're about to actually prove that point. You know what? We are. So let's start <laughs> with. I think this is probably just the first one. The first terminal app I want to show you is like. Um, it's uh, it's probably like just the for like you should if you get the most noob user and sit them down and run this, right? They're gonna think you are some sort of wizard. It's oh, called yeah. C Matrix, and uh, it is the Matrix code from the Matrix movie in your terminal. And there's a few different things you can throw at it to make it do mm-hmm. different things. And would you recommend that when it's presented that the person wear sunglasses and a trench coat yeah. to really offset the effect? Yeah, maybe That'd talk probably like help. The, yeah. Whoa, look at my terminal. Get some pills, you know, whoa. a blue and a red one. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, so there you go. That's C Matrix. Now that's that's pretty good, right? That's a, extremely cool. Yeah, I mean it's good. It's good, Matt. I don't know about extremely cool, but it's good. Let yeah, me I show thought it was you. cool. For something, see, this is we're we're kind of desensitized to what's cool. I think you show regular people that they're gonna be like, oh, oh yeah, wow. oh yeah. But I, I, do I, you know, it's getting colder. It's definitely getting colder here. It in is Washington, getting cold, right? And um, sometimes there's no mm-hmm. replacement for the warm crackle of an ASCII fire, Matt. So oh. there you go, A fire, A oh, fire, yeah. right there. The last one was called C Matrix. This yes. one is called A fire. And it is an ASCII fireplace, mm. right I, you know, there. I'm, I'm warming up a little bit already. Yeah, kind of, and now just now nice. you just need to imagine the crackle of the wood, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. maybe yep. the bits, as it is in this case. Right. So you got yourself an ASCII fire now. If maybe an ASCII fire is not the way you want to go, I got this next one for it's you. It's just not visual enough for me. Yeah. And by the way, I'll have all of these outlined on a website. Um, uh, there was a great write up over at zero t project. Yeah. dot com. Uh, there's a great write up over there where you guys can check it out. But now this next one is a. Sp- Special terminal app. This one's my favorite of all of them, and it, and I'll walk you through it. As you can see, it's going to have it needs a little setup. So uh, here I'll pull it up. I'll pull up the pull, the full screen here. It's called BB. All right. BB. Now when BB launches, it's going to ask you a few questions. So this is for your more serious uh, console in, um, connoisseur because you got to ask you got to answer a few things. So first of all, do you want music? Uh, the answer is yes or no. Of too, course. Too bad there isn't a hell yes, but I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're gonna do 16-bit output. Okay, good. I'm gonna tell it what surround sound or what card to use, and then I'll just tell it to continue. Now, okay, yeah, you pretty, won't be able to hear pretty it. Pretty simple choice. I got the headphones in, Matt. Sure. But it, when it starts up, it has to generate some math, and uh, it's going through and it is pre-calculating some data. And you know, you look at this and you go, okay, that's interesting, right? Well, um, what's cool is if you're showing this to someone, say, uh, you know, I'm, cool. I'm cycling through the launch codes, right? It and, totally uh, looks like you're. Yeah. It looks like it's zeroing in on the codes. It's exactly what it looks like, and maybe that's what it's doing. And it, co- it starts out with a whole right. bunch of ASCII character noise, but it transforms it's into something kind of amazing. Oh, here it goes. Here it goes. It's coming. Now get ready for this. This is all, now we now we are entertained by an ASCII art show. Look at that man! That is so cool. <laughs> Look at it's super trippy. Yeah. It's and uh, now, lava lamp. I. Look at that, right? Uh, how much? How much do you just not want to buy a, a whole rack of I, monitors I want just to run? App that allows me to make intros with this. I know, right? Quite frankly, actually. This very much could be an intro, right? Like I was thinking, yeah. like, could we take this and like chop up, and make an old retro Linux action show intro oh, totally. out of this? I think we could. That would be an awesome. So you can, uh, you can. So by the way, say now is a good time to fill in your registration card. I didn't actually have one, but uh, <laughs> it goes on for quite a while. Again, this is called BB, and uh, it's it's very old school, awesome. It shows you what you can really like. Oh, here it's going to show a picture of a guy here in a second. There you go. <laughs> Look at that! Nice. Man. All done in ASCII. That is funny. I mean, that's but it's like really detailed, right? <laughs> I know, like it's oh, it's spitting out a bunch of uh, information. Oh yeah, well you're getting the, you're getting this dossier here. That is. Oh, see, that's just very minority report. I love that. That's cool. <laughs> that's very cool. And here's a little uh, little space invaders uh, oh, type. Nice. Up. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, anyways, Boom. Let's run. oh, and there's a fire. Like a mushroom cloud, maybe. Yeah. 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 So it just kind of shows you how fun the terminal can be. It's uh, not all for serious work, that's man. That's cool. Not all about your CPUs and yeah, your processes right. and things like that. It's about having a good time. Yeah, it can also be used for a good time. There's a few other mm-hmm. ones. Uh, it eventually will draw a horse for us, a zebra, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I will link to the write-up that shows you a few of these things. I, I think maybe the C-Matrix one is the most straightforward, like, look mm-hmm. at me being a hacker. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right, yeah, I love that. I think that's cool. And I, I kind of would like to do them on a, like a uh, like a tablet. That could be oh, cool, too. Like, awesome. I totally hacked your tablet. Like yeah, a, uh, well, and especially when you're trying to get into a business and be like, you know, I really want to talk about your security concerns. I've run a few things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah that would be awesome. Exactly. Just as an April Fool's joke, obviously. Now, 
for the desktop uh, or just for the Linux Spotlight this week, um, there was a few options I could have gone mm-hmm. with, and you know, recently we looked at GNOME, and I thought this Cinnamon would be a great uh, pick. Yeah, but I think maybe yeah. we're going to save that for its own separate okay. review. Cool. I thought. Since we're talking about Ubuntu this week, mm-hmm. let's give a little love to a couple of other distributions that released this week. Yeah. So, you know, what a great idea. Share the love kind of a little balance bit. Balance it out a little bit. Yeah. Sure. sure. So, sure. the first one up is uh, just a point release for Debian. A Debian 7.2 was released this week. Without which we would have no Ubuntu. There you go. So, a uh, new updated version is out and available for you to download. And uh, Debian is the try and true. That's right. I mean, it's. You want stable, you want it, you know, no muss, no fuss. There you go. No surprises. No surprises. There you go. Now, something that might have a few surprises in it, Neptune 3.3 has been uh, released. Yeah. Based on Ubuntu, 64-bit only, shipping with KDE 4.11.2, mm-hmm. uh, Chromium 29 and VLC 2.1. And uh, it, this this is sort of answering the plea that we had in Linux Unplugged this week where you have a sort of uh, stable uh, underpinnings with uh, more fluid applications on the top. Right. This has sort of been slimmed down. They've removed things like Eclipse. Uh, they've removed your Pava control. Oh, Maybe yes. Like that. I, yeah, you know, I might have to put that back. But yeah, okay. you could. You could. could. Uh, so there you go. So Nept- looks cool. A new Neptune release is out. And then something that never gets enough love on the show but we always want to give it mention when okay. we think of it is a new release of PC Linux OS is out this is the 2013.10 version of K- mm-hmm. of their KDE spin and uh, this has Techstars touch on it even you can even get it with a Techstar uh, signature nice look at that I love that That's signature cool. edition right there yes. Uh, two different versions. The Mini Me version is available as well as the full version. Mini Me version clocks in at 632 megabytes. Full version 1.5 gigabytes. But maybe you're not of the KDE persuasion. That's right. I do you like yourself they have something some, a little uh, tighter, right? Alternatives. Yeah. Well, there's also PC Linux OS LXDE oh, nice. version available. Yeah. Nice. Now uh, the LXDE 32-bit desktop clocks in at 651 megabytes, and the 64-bit desktop clocks in at 699 right. megabytes. Uh, so there you go. Shipping with kernel 3.4.64. Nice. Yeah. And uh, I think PC Linux OS is one of those that. You it's know, tr- I, I it's tried and true and stable. Uh, one thing I would say is it's one of the faster distributions, especially yeah. when you're running some of the heavier desktops. I think people are really surprised at how fast it loads. I'll tell you what I like so, about cool. it is you can you can Mint is like this too to an extent, but uh, these these smaller distros. Uh, Mm, small. Mm, mm. Uh, yeah, the, more of a tightly knit community. Exactly. Yeah. It's like you can you can feel the hand of the creator throughout right. the whole distro, and that is kind of an interesting experience when you sometimes break out of these and think of these as more as software meets art in a sense. You know, mm-hmm. because there is a certain art to taking a collection of open source software and assembling it in a way that is coherent, usable, and then a community grows around. Um, and it's a different kind of art, but it is kind of art, and That's so. Right. These distributions, they they really kind of you can you can feel it a little bit. You can okay. feel the warm hand of uh, TechStar. That's right and, on uh, your shoulder. You know, and I usually f- I leave my feeling of TechStar to uh, our conversations on Google Plus, but sometimes I like to uh, feel his distro as well. <laughs> um, no, I just threw that out there for uh, you. He'll he'll troll me later for uh, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> you guys got like a thing on this side. I don't know. About oh that. my god! No, 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 no. Okay. No, he's he. I really admire what he did with this because I think it's such a great distribution with such a tightly knit community. It's mm. uh, it's really cool to see how it's still really addressing uh, modern concerns. It's got great package selection. It's a good distro, and it's still chugging yeah. right along, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember when it was a span spin off of Mandrake. Oh, I know, right? So there you go. Yes, it's yeah, been a he, long time. Uh, he and forked that off and made it something of its own. It's awesome. I think it looks like a pretty interesting LXDE setup too. It's a, a very attractive. Now, it should also be noted that the my understanding, anyways, the alter the other desktops that are not KDE are not. So much uh, something that's uh, blessed by him specifically, although he certainly gives it a thumbs up. He's not directly involved in the... But options. they haven't really been tuned Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you're kind of using a, more of a community project where the KDE version is absolutely uh, something he's involved with and uh, so on and so forth. So. There you go. Good good little uh, clarification yeah. there. All right, Matt, Yeesh. let's do the news. Mm. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com, Matt. Ting is mobile that makes sense. My mobile service provider, and I'm a very happy camper because over the weekend, I got the Android 4.3 update on my HTC One. Oh, did you see? Yep. Yep. I'm still rocking whatever they... uh... 4.1, 4.2? 4.1, 4.2? I think 4. it's 4, I think I 4. 2. I believe it's 4.2 on mine. So you, you'll probably be getting it soon, too. I believe so. so. Uh, this is my uh, Ting HTC One, and I absolutely love it. And this sucker, I get L- I get LTE, I get nice. 3G, I get fantastic battery life, and a great screen. And you know what? I was I always talk about the speakers on this thing, but I was using it for nav the other day, and it works oh, great really? for nav, Because you too. can really hear it with the road noise yeah. and whatnot. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Like, I don't have to pipe it through my car speakers exactly. or anything. 
Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about Ting because I'm just absolutely in love. So go over to, first of all, let's get you started. Go to last.ting.com. Now, why would you do that? Because you're going to save money. Let me tell you a little bit about it. The average Ting bill, $21. Okay. Now, Ting means no contracts and no early termination fees. That's what I love. Mm -hmm. Plus, no bundling of like unexpected things that surprise you on your bill. And they do include all the things you want, especially as a savvy user like hotspot, tethering, things like that. Plus, you only pay for what you use. This is a yep. really unique payment structure that Ting has. So if one month you're really heavy on your data or your phone, Ting will just add up your minutes, your megabytes, and your messages at the end of the, at the, end of the month, and whatever bucket you fall into, that's what you get billed. They're extremely fair about this. And if you don't use it very much, then you only pay a little amount. Well, and uh, I think it was the last billing period, I went just a little over my initial bucket, <laughs> yeah. and I got this email saying, hey, you know what? We're not going to roll you into the next bucket. We're just going to eat that cost. Ting's awesome. It's like, what? They are really, Blew really. my mind. Blew they my are. Mind. They are such a. They are such a great company. And that's just a small example of the many ways yeah. they are awesome. You know, I was thinking about uh, if I was in a position where I wasn't a big uh, smartphone user, and I, I was primarily interested in just having a phone, making calls, right. uh, maybe sending a few text messages. The most. Keep it simple. Keep sure. it very simple mm -hmm. and keep it cheap. Right. So this is what I love about Ting is you got the whole range. You can you have a couple of guys here who have the HTC like One and Note 2s, right? right? These are mobile computers, like especially the Note 2. Yes. Oh, yeah. You could live on that thing if your computer died, right? And and Ting is, is very accommodatable for power users like that. But also, if you just want to keep things simple, check out this Kyocera Kona phone they have. This is, in my opinion, the ultimate flip phone. Yeah, I mean it. This isn't a smartphone. Yeah. It's just a standard make calls. It's like the best flip phone ever made. This is perfect if you have a relative or a friend or perhaps even yourself who's just not wanting a smartphone. This yeah. is a perfect option. So with our last.ting.com discount, you can get this phone for $63 off Man. contract. So no contract, no early termination yeah. fees. $63. Then from that point forward, you only pay for what you use. Mm -hmm. a, a standard Ting line is $6. If you don't make a call, 6 bucks. If you right. have multiple lines, 6 bucks. This is so simple and straightforward. So go over to last.ting.com and check out some of these options you have. Of course, they've got things like the Moto X, which, by the way, Moto X pre-orders just started I, shipping out last week. And I can see myself week. doing a phone like this. It's like it's a really great backup line or backup phone. Maybe I need something for uh, just I need another line. Yeah. You know, well, option. and this is another great thing is Ting has an amazing dashboard. You can go in and turn phones on yeah. and off. So when you don't need the phone, you just turn it off. When you do need the phone, you mm -hmm. turn it back on. This thing is a, it's a it's a really robust phone. It even has a little two megapixel shooter in there. Yeah. It's probably not that awesome, but in a pinch, it's going to get the job done. And I bet you the battery life is absolutely fantastic. Oh, yeah. I bet you the battery life is amazing on this yes, thing. Absolutely. In a smartphone world, I, uh, it's interesting to the comparison between that and the flip. So if you just think about this. So if you go over to last.ting.com, you can get this phone for $63. Damn. Then you're only going to pay $6 plus whatever you use on top of that. So mm -hmm. if you use you know, a lot of minutes, you're covered. If you don't, you're covered. This is the perfect phone for right. that, for family members, for yourself. Or for a small business. This is another way where Ting is absolutely incredible for small businesses. You could arm your team with a with a fleet of smartphones or a bunch of simple phones and mm -hmm. focus on the essentials. And that's what I think is really great. But if that's not enough to sell you, mm -hmm. Ting also has an early termination relief program. It's very easy to take advantage of. You just go to ting.com slash ETF. First of all, grab a device you want from Ting. There's lots of one. I love my HTC One. The Moto X is there. The, the Samsung Galaxy series are there. Then you port your number. And then you submit your claim, and Ting will give you up to $75 per device. $75 per device to help out with that early termination fee. Which really adds up if you have a family plan on another network. That's right. So take advantage of that powerful online control panel. Take advantage of that fantastic customer service at 1-855-TING-FTW. When you call anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., a real person answers the phone. And I believe they're up in Canada. Wow. Yeah. No kidding. I did yeah. not know that. Yeah, I believe they're up in Canada. They have a little video on the Ting blog that uh, talks a little bit about it. It's pretty cool. Well, it's something worth investigating if you are uh, a northern neighbor. That's very true. The nice. average Ting bill is $21. Go, do, go start saving right now. They've got sure. a savings calculator right there at that landing page over at last.ting.com. You can plug in your bill, see what you're going to save. And when you combine our $25 off either your first month if you bring your own device or $25 off your first device, it's an absolutely great, great deal. You know, and it's just come down to this. Ting is the mobile service that respects their customers. They are the mobile company who treats their customers with respect. And for me, that's the bottom line. Right. Now, if I'm going to use a phone, it has to be on Ting. Just like if I'm going to play a game, it's got to support Linux. I don't play Windows games anymore. I don't buy cell phones on other networks anymore. I buy phones on Ting only mm -hmm. because I know that Ting is the, is, the, is the mobile company, is the mobile company that's changing things up and respecting their users. And I absolutely love that.
And I want to be part of that, too. And I think that's where change happens, is people decide to actually suck it up and participate instead of just pointing and saying, I wish this would stop or this would Amen change. To you, that, gotta, man. you actually got to participate. And the you know, great thing is Ting makes it a wonderful experience with that's their right. dashboard, with their customer support, with it being a great company and a fantastic selection of devices and no contracts. Yeah, I'm down with that. So thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. All right, Matt. Um, why don't we start this Ish. week with Cinnamon? This is one of the things All I was right. kind of... Pretty yeah. impressed by uh, Cinnamon 2.0 hit the web, and uh, even though Mint's not out yet, you can find it in some distros. Arch, 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 arch. Uh, but I'm sure it'll show up in your other distros <laughs> soon too. Uh, so Cinnamon 2.0 has been released. I was going to actually show you a write up from their official page, but uh, the database they're having. Let's see. Should I hit? Re- Maybe it's working yeah, now. Go ahead and hit it. I, no, I think they're probably still done. Still yeah, down. Still I think down. usually once a database it's a smackdown yeah. like that, it's going to take a pretty heavy. It's uh, okay, man. Yeah. It's okay. I got a backup over here. A web update. Yep. They did a great write up. So Cinnamon 2.0 has been out now. I think the first thing to really acknowledge about Cinnamon 2.0 is it is now its own complete entire desktop environment. Uh, Cinnamon is still built on GNOME technologies, and it uses GTK, but it no longer requires GNOME itself to be installed. It now communicates with its own backend, services, libraries, daemons, and all that kind of stuff. That's quite an evolution. Huge, for two reasons. A, Mm -hmm. it means that you're not going to bork your GNOME install, hopefully, when you load Cinnamon, and B, it lets them kind of take more control of their future direction. Uh, There's a lot of small things in uh, Cinnamon, like improved edge tiling for how you arrange Windows, in fact, I had over here on the Google Cache version. Yeah, here we go. See, the, the Google Cache is working, Matt. Of course. Uh, here's a screenshot of some of the new ways you can arrange your uh, your windows in Cinnamon. Oh, that's really nice. And so by just basically arranging them with your mouse, it will snap into place, I would assume. And the new, and the new Nemo browser uh, file manager looks amazing. They've done a lot of small little things like... Check out over here on the side, Matt. Now, this isn't a full review. I think we might do a full review here on the show. But okay. you see how they have, like, item info over here? Like, uh, under the home folder, they have your total uh, space available. Oh, down over your see, main I file like system. that. Yeah, and here, that. That's saving me time. And someone has their happy. iPhone plugged in and it's giving them the storage <laughs> nice. available on their iPhone. you got nice eject icons. Ooh. Also, just the color difference is nice. And they, they manage to keep your favorite thing, the location mm, bar. Yeah, no kidding, right? And it's, but, you know, it's still extremely functional, very fast. I mean, it's files, a.k.a. Nautilus, that we all know and love. But they're continuing to make it better. Um, so we go through one of the other things they've worked on. Now, we talked a little bit about this in, in context of GNOME recently, right. but Cinnamon's also focusing on some of their menus. They've, here's their user menu. You can turn notifications on and off. By the way, I love this feature because yeah. when I'm working... I and, don't need that crap. No, yeah. especially if I'm like oh. idling in IRC and I have IM open and all. I don't need all those notifications all the time. I love that they've put and that I, in and, there. And that you're able to get to it without having to dance through a bunch of stuff to find it. I mean, you're mm-hmm. able to just bam. Mm-hmm. And also their uh, their audio controls are really nice. Yeah, and check out all the, uh, kind of reminds me of uh, the old Windows days a little bit, but you oh, can wow. you can yeah. add all these sound effects nice. to your different <laughs> options in Cinnamon. I'll tell you what, there, there's one I'd thing. Have fun with that. The, only one thing they should be used for, ladies and gentlemen. L car sound effects, right? You get all the different <laughs> enterprise computer sounds in there, so that way you've got the. Oh com- man, you got like great. you're minimizing windows, <laughs> right? Yeah, and then doors in, opening and closing. Yeah, it, open hailing frequencies for when you start cinnamon things like that. So that's perfect for the Star Trek sound effects. Oh man, no, if you're launching like if you're launching uh, maybe a, a SIP client or something like that. Oh yeah, that'd totally be great, right. Right. Mm-hmm. A new sound app that's been added. Uh, some new improved on-screen notification stuff. Uh, new expo, expo they call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way the windows are arranged. So much, so much to cover that I think we're going to break it off into its own review. Yeah, I think but it needs its own review because this is a quite a bit bigger than uh, previous uh, releases. It seems like new, new Nemo uh, preview for previewing mm. files. Um, I think it's where you tap the space bar and then it opens right. up the file and previews it, kind of like on the Mac. And uh, like there's a, an add-on for for GNOME. Uh, it's, God, there's so many things I could go on. I think it's, I don't know. I'm yeah. just going to say it. I'm surprised. I'm surprised, and I think that when you're using other desktop environments, I'm not saying that you should rush out and use Linux Mint, but I think if you're using other desktop environments um, and you're using other file managers, you find yourself saying, "Boy, I feel like I'm I, I, I'm fi- I feel like I'm in a Finding Nemo predicament." Oh, man, look what you did! Yeah, I was terrible, but anyway, but you know, I'm serious. I, I kind of like the whole Nemo experience. Yeah. I think it's really cool. Well, that's one of the nice things too about them not requiring uh, certain versions of GNOME on the back end is you could have yourself your your perfect desktop and then right. load the Nemo component. Um, That's exactly it too. They've done other things like KDE does now, where they they're collapsing copy mm-hmm. uh, copies into um, into the tray. So when you copy a large file, you can actually have the uh, the file status up in your and system tray. I want tray. that. Yeah. I really do because it's it's telling me what's going on without being annoying. Exactly, kind of getting out of your way. Yes. So a, a lot a lot to cover in there. But I, when I say surprised, I just mean um, I I 
I guess I had lower expectations for Cinnamon 2.0, and I don't know why I did. It's just because it seems like a small project that's used by a smaller subset of the community. So they're I, they're ones to watch. I, I think Mint in general, while they definitely have their issues, I think they're doing a lot of things right. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's going to take time to get everything ironed out. I so. agree. So we'll uh, catch a future. Uh, maybe we'll wait for like one point update. I don't know. We'll wait a couple of weeks to let things iron out, and then I think mm-hmm. we'll have a we'll have a review here in the show. So uh, this story about HP kind of caused a little bit of a dust up this week, and I don't know how much of it's, I mean, TechCrunch sometimes just takes some of this stuff and kind of runs with it, but uh, here we go. So uh, here's the headline. HP admits what we all already knew, Microsoft is at war with its OEM partners. Mm -hmm. Now, this is kind of obvious when you look at them buying up Nokia, producing their own Surface devices. I think think HP's finally been like, you know what? Screw you. Uh, (laughs) I think we're So HP sells software and services Mm -hmm. and devices just like microsoft does yes uh so here's a key quote from uh, ceo meg whitman uh she says current hp partners like intel and microsoft are turning from partners into outright competitors dun 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 so they're kind of having an adversary uh a role going here and as a side so that those are her words right Mm -hmm. now what are their actions hp's actions are they're doubling down on Chrome OS and Android devices. So they're going to ship a whole new line of Chrome OS and Android devices in 2014 as sort of a middle finger to Microsoft saying, look, you guys aren't delivering for us. I think on, on the Android front, wait, complete and total waste of time. Uh, I, think on the, I think on the Chrome OS uh, front of it, absolutely right. Um, I think that's I think that's really, you know, for, uh, from the consumer side of things, I think that makes a lot of sense. Just look, look at what's selling. But as far as Android's concerned, it's kind of like, wh- why be a fish in that pond? You're t- you're don't, don't be another Microsoft. Well, does this change your you mind? Know? So the rumor is Android on laptops. Not like, now there also have been rumors no. of tablets and phones, yeah. but the new rumor is, um, I think a manual leaked. A, a manual. Um, oh, and this was a Lenovo yeah. manual. There's a manual out there. But anyways, the rumor is, is that uh, you're going to get, ARM laptops or, or low-end Intel laptops yeah. running Android. It, it feels like we're doing Zombu all over again with their laptops and whatnot. I, you know, it's they're underpowered. They're, you know, I think they will be comparably underpowered. I think, I personally, I think that the Chrome OS is really where they should be focusing their attention. But, uh, allow Google to continue to develop the marketplace there. I think it lends itself better to a uh, laptop desktop experience versus going with Android. I just, I don't mm. think Android's appropriate for that uh, form factor. I just don't. I, so to me, you know. like Chrome OS, it is... Um, it's young, but it, it's getting there. I can't help but feel, though, that it's it's the netbook idea just sort of recooked up. Like, we took the we took the leftovers that we left in the fridge for mm-hmm. a couple of years after we had uh, a fling with tablets, <laughs> and now we're just sort of reheating those leftovers and repackaging it. Like, you know, here's the it's like, here's the netbook hardware. It's it's the slowest, cheapest of what well, we can produce today. It's exactly what the netbook stuff was, and I feel like we've been there, done that. Well, the problem, the problem with netbooks from the beginning, in my opinion, is that it started out as, okay, here's a real opportunity for Linux users. They blew it big time there. And, of course, Microsoft got a hold of it, did starter editions and all this other garbage that was just junk, you know, limited to three degrees from tomorrow. But I, I still run a netbook, and, and they're not – for people that are not super geeky and that just want something real, you know, great battery life and it's super portable, I still think there's something there. I, but I think the Chromebook takes that a step further because I think that they actually come with a yeah. safe, idiot-free experience You're that right. you can give to anybody and be like, you've never used a computer before. You literally well, can't break this unless you drop and it. And they have those that know. Google brand and Google services that sort of focus yeah, the people consumer's know understanding. They, they can have, find software easy. They know they have a good set of expectations. And if you want to live in that world, it's functional. Yeah. Um, assuming you have internet. It's not, yeah, assuming you have internet and you are not geeky. If you're geeky, you're going to either tolerate it or it's just something you're using as a supplement. I don't want to so, I don't want to yeah. uh, short sell this, though. I mean, so let's put this in perspective here. Yeah. HP, 330 330. 330,000, I think it is. Mm-hmm. I think it's like some insane amount of employees, okay? Yeah. Um, and they have they have been sucking up the Microsoft teat for years and years and years. They have they have they have a long-standing Unix division. They, they have a long-standing printing division. I mean, obviously. Sure. But when it comes to like this really fat, juicy middle layer where they sell yeah. x86 servers at a markup, uh, they have been I mean, literally just like a baby attached to Microsoft's boob. And now they're saying, "You know what?" Time to wean off the Microsoft juice. We got to refactor our whole business here. Well, and I think after her announcement, she they essentially just chewed it off, spit it back in their face, and said, "Thanks for nothing, guys. We're going this way now." I feel like yeah. Microsoft is the one that started, though, because like yeah. they were saying in this article here, like when you go to the Microsoft campus, nobody at Microsoft is using any other competitors or I'm sorry, partners' product. They're all using Microsoft Surface. They're all using Nokia phones. They're not using an HP Slate. They're not using an HTC phone, right? That's true. 
So um, HP sees this and they say, well, look, you've got your, you know, your crazy workforce there and you guys aren't even internally evangelizing our products. Essentially, they, I think HP recognizes that Microsoft is in this position where they're too weak to say we don't need our partners, yes. but they're also trying to desperately reform into this market where you need to have this totally integrated stack, and so you have to sell your own product. So at the same time, like they are competing with their partners. Well, and I would also point out, and HP may not be aware of this, other Microsoft partners that are more service-centric, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, event uh, planning uh, organizations that do events for Microsoft, as well as other uh, partners in that regard, they're using Microsoft hardware now. They're using Surface, like when they're on the go. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, they use them like desktop. laptops. And even yeah, and even then, I don't see a lot of HP usage even when they're not using laptops. I mean, so, it's like you, you know, know, it's too bad know, that uh, Meg didn't call up Shuttleworth and be like, uh, "Hey, Mark, so yeah. look, this Microsoft thing turns out bad call, and we're wondering if we could work with you to make your touch operating system awesome." And we would right. like to give yeah. you uh, access to our hardware engineers. We'll work in tandem with your teams, and we will create the first premier Ubuntu Touch device. And, and emphasis on premier, uh, because we've seen Dell with their attempts, and yeah. um, oh. they're, they're they're pretty lackluster. No, too, it really needs to be the soft. two companies working in tandem yeah. with with unified visions Ex and goals. Exactly. Uh, a unified more exclusivity. Yeah. Unified in their battle against mm -hmm. Microsoft mm -hmm. and Android. But like yeah. you say, if HP throws in behind Android. They're going to get lost in the wash. They are, and not only that, but and I haven't now. I haven't looked at HP in recent years, but in the past, their build quality has been, I, I'm going to say, horrible. Um, I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, just you know, laptops especially. It's just really, I was never that impressed, especially with the uh, various uh, hardware issues, power, you know, power issues, things of that sort. Um, that being said, I'm a big fan of what they've done with printer drivers for Linux. I think that's awesome. HP Lip is. Awesome. I, I love that. But yeah, when it comes to computers, I don't really think, mm, I want to get me an HP. Also, this I think... It doesn't really happen. I think maybe what's unique about this so. is this is HP being public about it. Because yeah. at the same time, you also see uh, Lenovo has leaked and announced certain products. But Le Lenovo is the one that leaked the manual mm. with an Android-powered laptop. Yes. Lenovo is also going in this direction. Now, Lenovo is the number one laptop seller for Windows hardware. And they are looking... So everybody is sort of deserting Microsoft, it yeah. seems, just slowly... You know, they're doing it at, over a transition period. We are watching the rats flee the sinking ship right now. Yes. I think we are. I think they're circling the drain. We're watching the rats flee the Microsoft ship. I think there's no question to that because, I mean, look at how much hassle uh, Microsoft's created for them. And then, quite frankly, as you pointed out, Microsoft essentially did this first when they said, hey, we're going to go into hardware. Mm -hmm. Screw you guys. They brought it on themselves, Yeah, didn't they, they really did. Yeah. And, you know, so I think it's going to be interesting. I think HP's challenges will basically come down to uh, build hardware that I actually want to buy. Um, just putting that out there. <laughs> Give me a reason. Give to me buy a reason it. to care. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, for cheap printers, you guys do fine. I don't have an issue there. But I think for uh, computer hardware, not so much. Um, also, really pick an operating system that is going to work well with this. Android, not so much. Chrome OS, maybe yeah, if there was start, like some, some sort of, of you know web friendly OS, like a web OS, like a web OS, like yeah, some sort of. Only there was some web OS something that you could right that could take advantage in. of modern web technologies and yeah. had a really good to use interface that worked fantastic on phones or tablets. Already with had apps great multitasking. Yeah. Maybe could even had utilize. a community. Right. You know, if they, if they could, yeah, man, if there was just something out there like that, that would really be something. <laughs> Come on, HP, wake up. Yeah. Uh, all right, last story New on leadership. the news docket this week. Something that we really don't know too much about, but no. um, I, I would love to get in. I would. I got yes. the I got the email. Tell me about it, but I didn't get an invite code, and oh, I really? want in. That's kind of irritating. I know. Like, hey, by the way, we're really? doing this, and then when you go to sign up, like, give us the code you got in the email. I'm like, I didn't get a code. So it's Steam Dev Days. Mm -hmm. uh, it is taking place January 15th and 16th. Here in the Pacific Northwest, in nice. Seattle, just you know, minutes from our home. Well, sure. about fifty of them. <laughs> this guy, <laughs> about forty <laughs> from my me, home. Yeah, about an hour and a half from Matt's home. <laughs> uh, so, Steam Dev Days is uh, it's a two day developer conference yeah. where professionals can meet in a relaxed, off the record environment. Developers will share their design and industry expertise, participate in roundtable discussions, and attend lectures by industry veterans on topics ranging from game economies to VR, Linux, OpenGL, user generated content, and more. Developers will also have direct access to Valve's Steam team mm. and will be given a chance to test drive and mm. provide feedback on Steam OS, prototype Steam machines, and Steam controllers. <laughs> that sounds really awesome, especially if they do the Steam controller demos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just watching mm. the uh, the demo of it, and uh, 
Um, so they're doing it there at the uh, convention place where uh, we have gone to a mini event at. And uh, man, I want in. Anyone watching it, Valve? Man, I want in so bad. And it's just down the street. And, and, I- and if you accidentally say, "Hey, you know what? What? You know what? You guys are really awesome. We're just going to go ahead and lend you a, 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 one of our uh, uh, steam machines. Bring it to, back. You know, That'd just to do a demo. I mean, we're okay with this. Or if I could just get video of it. I mean, uh, right? Yeah. Secret, sneaky. Uh, anyways. So this is not um, yeah. a full-fledged like developer conference. It's actually more my speed. It's a yeah. little more relaxed, laid back, right? A little less geeky. Yeah. I think maybe one has to consider the fact that this could be the beginning of Valve doing annual or whatever the schedule would be Steam developer conferences, where the where you got to imagine the focus would be Steam OS and mm-hmm. creating games for Linux. And I think doing it in Seattle is awesome because it's just a total slap to Microsoft, and I love that. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, it is. And yeah. it's a, but it's also a good place from a technology uh, standpoint as well. People get it. It's funny because when Microsoft was asked about SteamOS, they had the same reaction they had to the iPhone. Uh, they went, oh, <laughs> SteamOS, nobody's going to buy that. That's not a threat to yeah. us. We're pretty happy where we're at in the market. Like mm-hmm. literally the exact same thing Bomber said about the iPhone, they just said about SteamOS. So, I, I, and this is the same company that initially when they were coming out with their latest Xbox, initially they were like, you know what, we that whole used game market, now we don't need that. And then they, of course, retro back on it, realizing yeah. that they shot yeah. themselves but yeah. this is a company that doesn't have a clue. Yeah. So Valve does. I'm pretty excited. And I wonder if this isn't the beginning of a more reoccurring Steve De- Steam Developer yes. Conference. Um, Steam Dev Days, January 15th through the 16th in Seattle. God, I'd love to get in there. Valve, I'm just saying. Son. Just saying, call me. Call me. Or email. We have a real easy to use contact form. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just shoot it in there or yeah. email me chris at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Right. I'm just saying, I could, I could. I could come back here. I could tell folks how, right. how interesting it was. It'd be good. It'd well, be good. Even demo a box. I mean, Same. it's literally in my backyard. Yeah. If literally. you consider, you know, if you took the whole world into scale. It's like my backyard. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's not literally my backyard. Literally. That'd be yeah. kind of weird. So I'm um, pretty excited. And whatever does happen, even if we don't make it in, we'll be sussing out. In fact, if we don't make it in, then we might not be, be held to any kind of NDAs. We might be able to just cover any leaks that come out. Yeah. You never know. This is true. It might even be better this if we don't make true. it in. Yeah. So, but we'll mm. keep an eye on it because I'm pretty excited, Matt. I'm, mm. pretty excited. I'm very excited. All right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. It's time for us to take a look at Ubuntu 1310, the freshest release from the folks over at Canonical. But before we get into that, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76, creators yes. of the finest machines out there born to run Ubuntu Linux. And I have to tell you, uh, there is a great line of options these days. You got the Grizzell Professional, which I think is probably a great laptop. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I myself, have enjoyed the Bonobo Extreme. Oh, now. yeah. Enjoyed is an understatement. Uh, he, yeah. He's made it a lifestyle. <laughs> he's had a deep, meaningful relationship yes, with this computer. Exactly. Well, how can you not, Matt? Uh, these, first of all, they're built from the finest technology out there. Core i7 processors, fantastic NVIDIA cards. They ship with Ubuntu. They run and support Ubuntu for years and years. Um, and I've loaded mine up with two SSDs, 16 gigs of RAM, rock and i7 processor. And also, maybe you're out there, you want to build your own Steam OS. You want to build your own Steam box? i got to give a plug to the Rattel Performance. Yes. I, this, to me, is, is, a, is, a, is a monster of a machine. that is like, It's like the sleeper machine over at System76 so. because it's quiet, it's small, it's little. You, you think, oh, that's cute. It's an adorable machine. It's a powerhouse. It's a total powerhouse with a Haswell processor in it. How could you not, right? It's, you could also kick it up with an NVIDIA graphics card if you want to. Um, Imagine and- that with the SteamOS controller. I mean, how awesome that would be to actually be able to plug know, that right? in and just, I mean, because it, it's the form factor is really Oh, perfectly attractive for a living room. And we've got a wild dog performance. Yes. Another great machine runs totally quiet. But we we were uh, when we first brought this in house, we threw every kind of video test at this yes. thing we could to try to kick it up to make it run really right. hot. No, the nah. cooling in this thing is fantastic. All of these System 76 machines always use large quiet fans right. whenever possible to make it a really nice experience. You have a Linux supercomputer sitting under your desk that is supported by a company mm-hmm. that is intimately involved in the Linux community. Helps the Linux community, pushes the pushes the envelope forward, and at the same time gives you a great user experience. How can you go wrong there? So go over to system76.com, get yourself something nice, and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Trust me, that's right. you're going to love it. And yes, for those that keep asking me, they do actually ship internationally. It depends on where you live, but they do have a number of things available. So check out their shipping options. Yep, they do. They have a page dedicated to that's it. That's right. You guys can check it out. Okay, so I'll be uh, I'll be frank with you, Matt. This okay. is probably the hardest Linux distro review I've ever had to do. Yeah, it, it's tough because we've although we have learned from past uh, reviews in this space because we know what to expect and mm-hmm. what not to expect. So yeah. I think that helped a little bit, yeah. but it is still very tough. It was a little bit of like, 
what yeah, you okay. need almost you like know, uh, you almost kind of need like for me I need like a track to lock into right and then I can kind of think of the distro in that context so I, I think I found it for Ubuntu 1310 and I want to share it with you okay and okay. It, it actually came from the director of Battlefield uh, oh, he, yeah. he said uh, in a recent statement that was uh, on the 12th of October so yesterday Linux only needs one killer game to explode he goes on to say we strongly want to get into Linux for a reason uh, it took Halo for the first Xbox to kick off and go crazy. Usually it takes one killer app or game, and then people are more than willing to adopt it. It's not, it's not hard to get your hands on Linux, for example. It only takes one game that motivates you to get there. And I, I think this is an interesting thought experiment. That's a really good experiment. point, actually. Because we, obviously we've been covering the progression of Steam, Steam OS, mm -hmm. gaming on Linux has been a huge topic for 2013. Yes. And I mean, it really has been the dominant Linux topic for 2013, justifiably so. And I thought about this, like, what if you know, something crazy like Half-Life 3 comes out as free on Linux, right. or, you know, there's some sort of exclusive that hits on Linux for six months. Would we have this massive flood and this massive influx of users? I actually think we could be in a position now where that would actually happen. Windows is a train wreck. It continues to be a train wreck. 8.1 will be a total flop for all the same reasons 8 was a flop. It's not going to solve the problems people want. Consoles are going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. They're out. They're you know they're they're a ways out still. They're kind of going the way of the DVD and and optical media in general. They are. Uh, consoles are you know the the, tr the traditional sense of consoles is starting to feel a little outdated, mm -hmm. a little outmoded, and a little slow in a, in a new user generated dominated internet world. So uh, I actually think this could be true. And so within that context, I thought is Ubuntu thirteen ten ready for this massive influx? Let's just say one day in you know early early December, Valve says. Okay, everybody, Half-Life 3 beta is available, and it's only on Linux. Even if they just did the beta. And even if only for a set period of time to where they, they don't want to necessarily lose out on sales on other platforms, but if they did it on Linux first and did it for like a good three to six months, mm -hmm. that would be a big, and even for half the cost, half-life, half-cost, I mean, you know, yeah, that would be awesome. So uh, I, I wanted to so I wanted to think you know is thirteen ten ready for this? Is it, if 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 that watershed moment oh. happens, is it prepared? And I also, you know, it's 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 that's a conflict with what the with what Mark yeah. Shuttleworth's vision is. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth says uh, the Ubuntu Edge dream lives on in the iPhone. Uh, he goes on to say, ultimately, the Edge. This is an article over at ZDNet writing this part. Ultimately, the Edge failed to win enough funding to get made. But the man behind the device, Canonical founder Mark Shuttleworth, claims the vision of having a single device serve as a PC and a mobile lives in in Apple's iPhone S. Uh, he says it's no coincidence that Apple described the A7 processor as a desktop class processor. He says, and this is a quote from Mark, I think the Edge may have accelerated the idea of convergence. You saw Apple's description of their new mobile desk CPU as a desktop class, and I don't think that's accidental. He yeah, says a number of carriers well. have expressed interest. The handset manufacturers are putting time and effort into understanding Ubuntu and evaluating its performance on their hardware. In due course, we'll pick a partner for launch. Like he's, he, I love how he acts like they get their pick of the litter from, from partners. Oh, yeah, of course, right? Yeah. He says, at present, uh, Shuttleworth estimates that a converged OS code base will be in place after 1404, uh, and if not then, it should at least be ready by 1510. Now, well, I, I thought this was an interesting... So we have two... Here we are. Yeah. We have a market reality. We talked about uh, Mercedes adopting Ubuntu. We got an email last week from a guy who just started a job at Amazon... He said he started at Amazon in one of their more technical areas. He walked in, he opened the door, and he was his mouth dropped open when every desktop there was running Ubuntu 1204. Mm -hmm. So we have this massive desktop adoption that's happening at a grassroots. Anybody who's out in the field now is seeing this. You are seeing people are choosing Ubuntu, right? It's that becoming the Windows XP of Linux, that's but true. like in a good way. Well, and I think here's why we're seeing less uh, innovation on the Ubuntu desktop front is I think that they know, the, the developers and, and, and Mark and all these guys know that it's already making this mark. I believe they know this. So I think they say, all right, you know what, we got to maintain it at this level. It's working. It's fine. It's whatever. We're going to pipe dream over here with our whole mobile nonsense and uh, we'll keep supporting what's going on. And that way, you know, we kind of get some branding recognition from in the enterprise and with home users and whatnot. And I think that's a mistake. I think that... If I was Ubuntu, I would make, I'd take Valve a lot more seriously, and I would focus more on the enterprise and gaming front, and stop with this nonsense that the desktop's dying. I think I think that it's evolving. I don't think it's dying. I think well, this whole I think mobile if, thing is just I think nonsense. If, if Canonical played their cards right, it it would be the desktop is alive and well in Ubuntu, but right now it's like it's it's sort of succeeding on its own, you know, in a sense. Yeah. And and so what I mean by that is I I think you're right in the sense that they are sort of just letting, they're allowing momentum to carry it forward. Yeah, they are. And I think but they're this, risking stagnation too. 
this is what we are what we are touching on right now is the fundamental cost of them going off in their own direction with mm -hmm. upstart and unity and all of these things because if this was fedora we were talking about right or open susa or any of them they could literally almost do nothing and i'm not saying they do they all work very hard but they could almost literally do nothing and sit back and just snapshot the latest versions of kd or gnome and they would automatically get all of these features they would right. automatically get all of this new stuff Ubuntu does not sit in that position anymore. If they don't push Unity forward, then when we get a new release, we get really nothing. We get yeah. nothing. Now, that's not totally the case here, but they are suffering from that a bit. They are. I mean, in fairness to Ubuntu, that yes, the uh, performance tweaks are noticeable. Um, I've definitely found it to be uh, surprisingly good in that regard. Yeah, and I think this you is know. where we should jump in here because uh, I, they are benefiting from you know a new, a Linux 3.11, right? They're benefiting yeah. from all of these improvements under the hood. This is truly, and I, I feel like I say this all the time, and I'm glad I do. This is truly the fastest Ubuntu release I've ever used. Yeah, and which is a good thing that it's we're not seeing uh, the regression headaches that we used to see. I'm actually right. finding that, oh, hey, look, it's not broken. Hey, look, this isn't uh, an right. issue. That's awesome. And and something that's not visible to us end users is 13.10 has also seen a ton of work for OpenStack and, and, yeah. and quote-unquote cloud duties. And uh, they have seen a lot of work around this. And this is an area where Canonical still continues to put focus and effort mm -hmm. and really innovate here. Juju has gotten amazing. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to break out a review of Ubuntu's cloud services like Juju and things like that, the automated deployment of, of right. Ubuntu services. We're going to break that off into its own segment, its own review yeah. in a future episode because I believe that deserves its own dedicated focus. But I did want to highlight here for this review that we acknowledge there has been a lot of interesting improvements in that regard. That's true. That's so it's something true. to consider. But let's, let's start with the desktop itself. Okay. The biggest feature in my opinion, is probably the new uh, smart scopes and things like that, right? Uh, yeah, and, and that's unfortunate because that was the biggest feature. It's the feature that I care least about. And, let's, you know, let's and that was a problem a for me. So. Let's give it a spin right here live on the show. So I bring up the dash. And, Performance uh, is good, though. Oh, yeah. You know what? That's the one thing I got to give them props on. It's and, like, holy cow. And that was the thing I was the hardest on during the betas yeah. is I said it was almost unbearably slow. Yeah. Uh, and that was just as they were developing it. It it is now as fast as for for a launcher. Like if I type in G edit and hit enter, yeah. Well, that's not as fast as Synapse, but it's pretty fast. It is pretty fast. It's it's usable for me. I mean, granted, I'm still going to go into privacy and turn it off anyway. But but I think for someone that wants to uh, have that as an option for software discovery and things like that, that's great. So I still wish they get rid of some of the other. Let's things. Let's use but, it as so. Uh, yeah. They they envision a scenario where. Um, Every, every bit of information you ever want is available at your fingertips in the dash. So let's say I'm curious about Obama. So I'll put yeah. Obama in here, right? So when I type in Obama, now the first thing it does, and I, I appreciate this, is it pulls up all my local files. And I have, as you can see in the results, 199 files with Obama in it because they're all like unfiltered right, clips sure. or documentation, mm -hmm. things like that. The next few things it does, I kind of go off the rails here. Like I can search... For ya in Yahoo stocks for Obama, right. I can Which do a, is like, I can do a Google yeah. News search. Let's do a Google News search, right? Okay. So I click that, and I get there it's, we go. So then I yeah. get these results here, and then I can click that result, and I get a truncated description of what's going on with a pretty blurry photo because that's what the source was available. Sure. And then if I click view. It launches my browser, right? Which it just it, it sound, it's one of those things that sounded really great on paper, but it's just kind of like, eh. You well, know? what, what, in what scenario would I not use that? I mean, I just cannot envision a scenario where I would not use that once or twice and be like, nah, just easier to launch my browser and type it into Google. I think what they're trying to do, and I and I this is not not a feature for me. Maybe it is for somebody else. I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to make this a new uh, workflow. Or people that yes. maybe don't have an opinion or a view on it and yeah. say, oh, okay, this is a new workflow they can adapt. So the problem you know, is, is you know. so okay, so first of all, when I search for Obama, the first thing I get are music hits. Right. None of them are relevant. <laughs> Obama's latest hits. Then I, I get a like, second what? row of music hits. Yeah. Again, none of them are relevant. Then I get yeah. weather results, completely irrelevant, right? Uh, is that I, like a new DARPA program? This I mean, is just yeah, weird, right? <laughs> so then here, bizarre, okay, yeah. so then here, oh, look, here's, here's the uh, Wikipedia entry. So I click that. Sure. It pulls up, but again... It's a truncated Wikipedia entry. I really actually cannot get past the first paragraph and, and before you, I have to open up my web browser anyway. Right. And if you click the arrow next to that, oh, does, does that just open up another... Uh, go ahead and pop back so, into that. Oh, 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 so, oh, oh, see, it gets a, it's a okay, little... Okay, go ahead and do it on that one. You have an arrow or either one. Oh, okay. So here I go, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it'll go, to the, it'll go to the next result. Is that what that's doing? So th yeah. it's not like it's giving you an option to scroll down or to read more. It's uh, And I guess they probably do that so that they're not uh, going to get a, a cease and desist from whoever they're scraping. Maybe. That's what, yeah. yeah, maybe. Um, 
I I don't know. I look at this and I think, or there were, or they're pulling from RSS feeds and uh, they're who, working with partial RSS feeds. I don't know. Who I mean. at Canonical is looking at this and thinking that's beautiful, that's elegant? Who is who is the person with the taste saying, yeah. let's implement this? Because I would be ashamed <laughs> to ship my operating system with ads like this in it. I mean, it is. Uh, listen, I I understand they got to make money, and I understand it's about setting that Amazon cookie. But at right. the end of the day. It's about being practical about it. I mean, that's that's my big thing. Is if I'm searching for Obama, you darn well better keep it to. I mean, I if you're going to do this to me anyway, out of the box, at least keep it to news and to keep it and keep it to things that are not music. Don't you think it's you know, interesting I mean, that like the results vary every time? Too? Yeah, it, well, it's because it's very it's very wide ranged, and, and that's the so problem because they're trying in, to bring results up at any cost. If to, I type in edit, I get. Like the first thing, and I really do appreciate that. Like yeah. my local application results fire up immediately. Yeah, and that's good. That's good. And of course, it's court pre cached, and uh, you know, and the caching is obviously working for the internet stuff too. But I think where it gets funky is if you're typing in Obama and it's coming up with applications to uh, buy or to music download or, or music, and it's just kind of like, no. I mean, it's like I get what you guys are trying to do, but that's just stupid. You guys need to actually blacklist a few things and and, and have some variables there or something. I don't know. Now you can go in like right. You can go filter yeah. results, turn off music. Turn off whatever right, you want, but, that, but that's those are absolute. That that's the problem. Turn off that, more suggestions. Yeah, I mean, and that's cool. I mean, I think that, and that's that's a great feature. I think that's awesome. But it's not. But okay. it's for what they're trying to do. Even though I don't, I'm not a fan of this. Like you know, I search for not edit, effective. and like the, I, yeah. I search for the word edit. For, I was expecting G edit, right? Yeah. And that was the first result. So props to them. I could enter and be done. But when I look at these results, I, I see Led Zeppelin. Right. I see Jaws. <laughs> And I mean, is he an editor now? I mean, and we like, give what? KDE a hard time for class. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, know. we give KDE a hard time. This is this is so far and beyond anything KDE yeah. has ever done. I mean, this is true, legitimate spam in my launcher. It is spam. And that's where I would differentiate with most people. Uh, they incorrectly call it spyware and... Uh, well, you know, I, I say adware would be accurate. I would say spam is absolutely accurate because you're being spammed with it and it's not really being requested. So that's certainly valid. But spyware, it's like, are they are they pulling my is my login information being pulled or, or am I being is, is personal information being taken from me? Yes, I you know, it is. So here this is Amazon. This is from the, this goes from the terms servers, of service. But, eh. Search results are sent to Canonical. And then they are de they're anonymized at Canonical. So the, the, the results are not sent to third parties. Mm -hmm. However, Canonical states in their own in their own uh, terms of service they track what you search for and the IP it came from. Right. Okay. They also state in their own terms of service that if they are served a warrant, they will hand that information over. Now I know this sounds crazy. It sounds like a it sounds like Google or Bing or let's, anybody else. Let's all acknowledge that. You know, I was. I'll, I'll be. First I still think it sucks, but I don't see it as. I was more comfortable with it before Edward Snowden existed. Yeah. No, that's fair. And now when I know where, where you have companies like LavaBit right. where where federal uh, authorities will come in with uh, outrageous warrants. And so uh, there was just a recent crackdown on Tor and sure. Silk Road, right? Right. But spyware doesn't have an off button. So let's say you know, that's that's okay. my disconnect. I mean, I get it. It sucks. I wouldn't use it, but I it's like Look, you know. I don't I I really could not give two craps that it has an off button because yeah. the, the as you always state, the default is what rules the world. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And and here's the thing. In a post Snowden world, if I decide to run Tor browser, every time I enter Tor browser mm -hmm. into this, there is a ping that goes off to Canonical servers and says the person at this IP address just launched Tor. That's fair. Now, if I'm okay. the federal authorities, I can go subpoena those records and then I can say, well, look, we saw this Tor traffic mm -hmm. and we saw mm -hmm. your computer launch Tor at this time. Sure. Let's go get a warrant and search all of Chris's files because we saw when we subpoenaed Canonical's information that he launched the Tor browser on his computer, thereby giving us justifiable means to search his whole machine. That's true. That's true. I would like to see... I, no, I wouldn't like to why see Why do this, they but, even put know. themselves in that position? Uh, the same reason why everybody is so huggy-kissy about cloud services. Um, it, it's, it's features and functionality before privacy, and it's going to continue to progress that way because people are, frankly, stupid. Um, we just, you know, and that's why I don't, that's why I don't have a problem with this. Not, I have, I don't have a problem with it. I, I mean, I get the whole principle side of it, but at the same time, the practical side of it doesn't matter. The most people will always take convenience over privacy. They just will. Um, uh, grocery store, uh, membership cards. Um, you know, there are so many, I've got browsers just alone. I mean, God, Chrome on it by itself. I mean, any of these things by themselves, your ISP, there's so many things already doing it. It's a lot like. Uh, someone that has absolutely no security in mind when it comes to how they handle their web data, like such as like with Dash that you're pointing out, but also then they're really passionate about shredding their documents. It's kind of like, well, you know, you're using unencrypted services, all this sort of thing. So I think it's, you know, it, it's false. It's false security. I don't think that 
disabling that means a damn thing because there's 50 services that are going to do the exact same thing anyway. So yeah, for me, right. that that's my that's my big I, gripe what, about what, it. The just, main, you know, the main problem is is it gives it gives a it gives a record of the commands I launched on my Absolutely. computer. Absolutely. Yeah. That to it's me, a keylogger. I will see. I'll give you keylogger, but I wouldn't say Spyro. I say keylogger would be more identifiable. Keylogger with the with the remote back and forth. Yeah, sure. To their credit, it's easily yeah. disabled. You lose functionality, yeah. um, and and you, what you lose out is. Uh, the functionality you lose is the primary focus of their effort for the Unity desktop. Right. So yeah, yeah, kids, yeah you, I, can, you can turn it off, yeah. but then you you forfeit essentially eighty percent of the new that's features right. that go into the that's new Ubuntu right. release. So congratulations on that one. Yeah. It's, now, that's my big argument is that I don't. I think it sucks. Not from a privacy standpoint. I just think functionality wise, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Well, I don't use it. I don't like it. I think I that's. Like, you know, I think that's potentially the most offensive know. thing about it is its yeah, functionality. It it's weak. The results suck. Uh, display, it's ugly, it adds clutter, it's not well done, it's not elegant, and then privacy-wise, it sucks. And yeah. and what the worst thing Maybe about that. it is, Canonical tried to brush it over, like, oh, we've addressed the privacy issues, we've now anonymized the image results that we right. pull from Amazon. That's not good enough. No. I, I, I don't want you to ever, ever have any entry on any server of what my IP address was, yeah. or what commands I ran. I don't care if your update server knows because that doesn't give anybody an obvious trail of what I use. Right. And that was Mark's argument. Well, you give us root for your updates. That's updates. That's not the commands <laughs> exactly. I run. It's a huge right. difference. Yep. But anyways, I digress because you can turn it off and 1310 still has plenty to offer after that. Now, I want to get through some of the other hard things that I didn't like. Well, to, one, one quick thing I want to point out is if you have a problem with it, and believe me, I, this is what I do because I think it sucks feature-wise. I don't care. The privacy thing, I just don't use it, so it's not an issue. Use another desktop environment over it. I mean, oh yeah, that's what I see. So, that's that's what I do. Is that I like the underpinnings. You know, I just think that I, just I actually, don't bother with I actually think you know? Unity. Um, aside from the dash, um, this is this for me. I don't know. I I probably people think I'm an idiot. This for me, Unity is the perfect desktop. Um, it is a little bit, uh, a little bit traditional, a little bit old school, but also a little bit modern. And mm -hmm. the, and the lack of focus shows like. Menus look really old now, like yeah, especially after they Gnome really 310. Yeah. Looking at some of the stuff and and, yeah. and the KDE and Cinnamon, I look at this stuff and go, oh, so they haven't touched this code right. for 15 years. It looks like, but you know that stuff aside, sure. I love. There's a lot of little things I love about Unity. Uh, I, I I love the way Windows move around. I love the way Windows resize. A lot of people like to hate on Compiz. I think it shows. I, I like, like Compiz to this day, actually, with the bouncy windows. That's I mean, you me, can see you, know? <laughs> you can see Compiz is sitting right yeah. there at the top of my CPU sure, usage. Sure. So I mean, there is a tax for running Compiz, yeah. but at the same time, this the way Windows close, the way Windows open, the way Windows resize, mm. there is an elegance to it that is still unmatched on the other desktops. Snapping all mm, of that sure. stuff, Unity is it gets out of the way. It's mm -hmm. very practical. It's very functional. I like Unity a lot. It's just that dash. That dash has got to go. It's got to yeah. be completely scrapped. It's Le legitimately, the dash is a privacy concern. I give you that. The the dash is even a keylogger. I'll give you that one too. Um, spyware. I, yeah. I'm so sick of watching that term being misused. It, 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 yeah, it, it's not. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's a keylogger. I'll give you yeah. a keylogger, adware, all that. But um, you know, because until until that data has actually been actioned on, it's not spyware. <laughs> That's true. Well, you does know. all of this change so. if at some point we find out that uh, the GCHQ knocked on Canonical's headquarters and said, "Hey, we need to subpoena your records"? Then it's a, then it's a valid argument. And yeah. then I, now my, my my philosophy is just don't do it. Just don't don't participate. Don't, have it, yeah. don't you know? And I mean that for browsers, not just not just Unity browsers, all of it. Really be mindful of what how you use your data. Be really aware of it. So a you couple know, other points that so. I think were pain points for us, and then we'll get to the positive stuff. Yeah, yeah so don't, absolutely. You Ubuntu fans, don't lose your ass. <laughs> yeah, no. um, downloading devs. Um, I don't see a problem with this. See, I'm, I'm actually, I mean, I'm still spoiled by the whole Arch Repo thing, but, you know, for just regular folks. Yeah, but uh, look, at my, look at my downloads folder. These are all things that I had to download and manually yeah. install because either, A, they're not in the repo, like sure. uh, Fflux and um, BitTorrent Sync mm -hmm. and Handbrake. These things right. are not in the repos, so I have to go download them manually and add a PPA. And the result is, is I've been using this installation for a week and change, and I already have two repos because I've added some PPAs that hit as 404 on me. Right, right. Um, and, I, that, and see, that I think is the big thing. is that The way I see solving this is to take more of an open SUSE approach. Is I want to not only see uh, a way to easily, really easily make PPAs yourself mm. and actually have some, I hate to go cloud storage again, but here we are, go cloud storage with that. But also the fact that the existing PPA managers, and I forget uh, one of the more popular Why ones, PPA? Why PPA? I would love, the one thing it misses for me is discovery. I want to type in the yep. name of, I want to do yep. editing. 
and I want a list of PPA options out there and with yeah. a brief description. This is where uh, Arch obviously has the Arch user yeah. repo. OpenSUSE trounces yeah. uh, uh, Ubuntu in this. This, this again, I believe if Canonical were focused on improving mm -hmm. the desktop experience, yep. they would be solving this problem. Instead, we have this PPA solution, which works to get my latest Chrome yeah, exactly. and, and, and maybe right. my latest handbrake. But when I go beyond yeah. that, it starts to fall down and it starts to feel like I'm it's living in the very, 90s. Very hit and miss. Sometimes you find gold nuggets in there and I have found them, but then they 404, as you pointed out, or they uh, are not, they're being dropped. You know, I mean, there's a lot of variables there. So, I, so. you can't nail them too hard on that because... That's the same situation on Windows, oh, Mac sure. OS. Yeah. You but know, I'm saying, but other... this is an opportunity for them. Exactly. To, make to it sell. better. Yeah. yeah. And wouldn't it be great if like make some software discovery a little better in that dash if you're doing things in the oh, dash? Oh, and in the software center. I was I cross I was crossing my fingers thinking, please don't suck. Please. I mean, it's still it's fast yeah. enough and it's fine. It's just it's the same tired looking pathetic. Yeah, um so one other thing is and this is just a small yeah. point of contention, and maybe this works better on touch. Now when yeah. the launcher, when you click an app, mm -hmm. it it doesn't launch the app. Oh wait, yes it does. Never mind. I guess I lied. Oh, there you go. So sometimes oh, it, wow. uh, really? why would you why would you have that as a feature? To, uh, not you, but the Yeah, uh, like it's, it's pointless. I mean, it's like just brings up this so extra menu. Here, have some extra clicks. That's it's like the, they they took the problem I have with Software Center and said, you know what we need to do? We need to integrate that into the dash. Why, guys? But it's not Ubuntu integrated. Ubuntu is so though. solid under the underpinnings are so great, it, and they are. It's just weird that, though because it's not integrated. Geez. It's, it's I don't know. That's uh, annoying. So, yeah. but okay, that's the bad stuff. Yeah, so that's the go. bad stuff, and there's a lot of good stuff too. There is. So first of all, we already said one of them, uh, performance. Yeah, performance and, is fantastic, and, and the speed really... of the dash itself is 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 much improved. So I think yeah. twelve oh four nailed it, and uh, twelve ten yeah. we started to see a big drop off in performance. Sure. Thirteen oh four was better. Mm -hmm. 1310 mm -hmm. has really the performance yes. of the of the distro and the dash is amazing and you know for steam gamers that's a big thing also yeah. by the way i loaded up like 20 different steam games on this thing all of them worked including games that didn't, i could not get working under arch yep. for some reason i don't know why i never really troubleshooted that much uh yeah, works steam, just fine steam would be a big thing for me i've actually had way better way better luck with and, steam and when we Remember look that. in the context of maybe what ubuntu's for consumers mm -hmm. ubuntu's ubuntu's has Th this responsibility almost to make Steam sort of a smooth experience. It does if it wants to become relevant, remain relevant on the desktop. And, and they need to time. stay so. steady, tried and true mm -hmm. for the enterprise to That's adopt right. them. So this release accomplishes both those things. So yes. at the end of the day, all the criticism we have, those things are accomplished. Um, also, uh, I think it's it's notable that while I had I had to go out and get software like f dot f dot lux mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, where I could never get f.lux working under Arch right. for whatever reason. You you know that if you can find it under Ubuntu, it's probably it, going to work very work. well. f.lux, yeah. I've just fired yeah. it right up and it just worked first try. I didn't have to configure anything. Right. I didn't have to go load any dependencies and, and hook up any of this kind of stuff. It just mm -hmm. works. Right, and you think in some cases probably a lot of these developers are developing on Ubuntu. Oh, I'm sure of it. So that, yeah. that probably pays and that's, off. And that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking at it from uh, you don't like things to change a lot, Ubuntu's got that. You like you, you know if you if you want your the major new feature to be in performance, thirteen ten has got sure. that. And I think that uh, uh, it sounds like we're paying that, like we're minimizing that. But I think yeah. that's I think that's actually a really good thing for thirteen ten. Oh, I think and it's actually what I want. I think that because I do have an Ubuntu box, despite all my criticisms, that I run because I can do Skype reliably on it. I can run uh, my media stuff reliably on it. It works really well. So, so. I, you know, Ubuntu has the advantage of kind of being the first out of the gate yeah. um, with this new batch we got uh, open susa and fedora coming in november right. and uh, they both are pushing a little more on the feature side they are pushing more on the feature side and also just uh for people that want to make spins of uh, distributions i found that uh open susa is really awesome in that department not just with their actual distro maker if you will but also the fact that their rules are much much more lax so because uh, ubuntu's kind of are not so much let so. me ask you something Sometimes after these reviews, mm -hmm. you know, we go, oh, man. I'm going to get ripped either way. This is matter. so great. I'm switching, right? We right. go, oh, like after our Arch review, we're like, right. yep, switching yeah. for good. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've switched a, I've, I, I switched an entire release cycle open to SUSE a, a year ago because open SUSE was so good. Right. Um, I'm not switching to 1310. I Are will you? on I will on my not right away but I will on my Ubuntu box but my Manjir, my main PC my Manjaro box uh, my Manjaro technically slash Arch box um I no reason to change that because it's set up the way I like and it works the way I want it to yeah. and I'm good to go um if I already have an Ubuntu box set up which I do secondary yeah I'll, I'll probably upgrade it maybe eventually but yeah. I don't really have any big need to right now I think you nailed it so yeah. if you got yeah. a if you got a 1204 box and it's been feeling a little stale yeah. um. This is an awesome update for you. Like this is like if you like Ubuntu and all of that, what you have right. now, 
this is everything you want because it's it's what you've got now only just yes. better and, right? and make a suggestion on i would say you net booting this sucker on a flash drive before you just take the blind plunge just just to make sure yeah that you're running good on your hardware sure. and everything's working well um so you know i guess as so for me mm-hmm. um one of the reasons I use Linux is because I really get a thrill out of experiencing new open source software. Right. And I get a thrill out of watching the open source software I enjoy evolve and get better and better and better. Mm-hmm. I do not feel like Ubuntu is the desktop for me to do that anymore. And I, I don't I'm not disparaging it. I, I just You've taken it as far as you can take it for your I, needs. I'll yeah. give you an example. This okay. is this happened this week. Um one of the reasons why this was the hardest distro for me to ever review in the history of this show <laughs> is because right. on Monday or Tuesday, I think it was Monday, mm-hmm. uh, 1310, or I'm sorry, GNOME 310 hit Arch stable. Right. And 310 is sitting on the SSD on this laptop oh, just waiting yeah, for me to be right. done <laughs> right. with this review. And right. to me, I yeah. get a thrill and an excitement out of trying out the latest GNOME or, sure. hell, trying out the latest G-Edit or, right. hell, trying out the latest GTK to I. You know, yeah. it's like... For me, those are some of the biggest features of the mm-hmm. Linux desktop is is experiencing this global um, evolution of software right. and and doing it in rapid pace. And like you said wait, in the pre-show, you know? Ubuntu is kind of now off on a land of its own, and it's just it going to be getting more and more isolated in the sense that there's a lot going on around Ubuntu, but you know. Ubuntu is not affected. It, it don't care. Of, yeah, it's kind of uh, what did I say? It was kind of the Adam Sandler of Linux. It's it's you know it's very happy doing what it does. Um, a lot of people are kind of like, what the hell are you doing? But, you know, it does its thing. It's happy, and, and there's people that it caters to. And we so, get we yeah. got we had a fantastic thread in our subreddit from a Debian user. Yeah. We've got people in our IRC right now, and they're saying, well, look, what Chris is saying is he wants software that changes and pulls the rug out right from underneath them and gives them surprises. And I, I actually would say that's an old fuddy-duddy way of looking at Linux and yeah. open-source software. Uh, this is not the Linux of three or four years ago where everything was totally changing this is a linux where upstream is getting more stable True. more mature yeah. gnome is getting to a point where it's getting um very um predictable reliable kde the four series is becoming very very steady yep. very reliable uh chrome firefox thunderbird handbrake steam Quake, Smuxy, right. VLC, all of these applications are getting to the point where they're mature and they're not breaking. So this, I mean, it will still happen on a cutting it edge distro, happens. but we don't live in a world where just because you update, everything on your computer breaks anymore. That's, that's true. That's that's an old problem. It still exists, but it is... It's it much is harder to do, actually. A, yeah. the, the whole concept of snapshotting a distribution in time like 1310 is doing and living mm-hmm. in this frozen bubble is, is solving a problem... That doesn't really exist anymore. It's still a problem that needs addressing, I, I, especially yeah. in enterprise. Yeah, I was gonna say, especially yeah, in enterprise, yeah, yeah. It, it totally is still yeah. there in enterprise on servers. I mean, hello, I've sure. admin servers for years. I understand that. Yeah. But on the desktop, I believe that is being more driven by fear than it has been driven by actual usage and facts. I would argue that the people who make this point about oh, change is bad, it's going to break, are people who have not tried it for years and they have no mm-hmm. idea what they're actually talking about. And I believe these types of distributions are solving a problem that doesn't really exist anymore. And if you look at the mobile world, it's obvious that that is a rapid iteration, rapid pace. If you look at web apps, one of the things that is driving the use of web apps, like Google Docs and mm-hmm. all of these things, is rapid iteration, rapid releases. For better or for worse, this is the year 2013, and this is how software is made now. And these kinds of releases, while awesome and great for certain people, in my opinion... Are sort of the old school way of doing things. I would differ in that. Uh, going back to like PC Linux OS, I think one of the pe- the reason why that community is attracted to it is because it is even more uh, bubbleized than Ubuntu in a lot of ways. In that they know that these are applications that have been out for you know versions that have been out for a while. They know the experience. They're just really not interested in cutting edge, bleeding edge. That's just not something they're really into. So I would say that there's absolutely people out there that just, if it isn't broke, why fix it? Yeah. They're good with that. And I think um, that's exactly who this is for. Yeah. And I think that's fine. I think that's no problem. But I would agree with you in that the belief that something's going to break because you update, I have not experienced, and, and I'm very honest about this, I've not experienced that with any distribution in recent 
years, actually. Yeah. I really haven't. That's not to say it can't happen, and I'm, and if it isn't broke, it probably I'll fix will. It, but, but it could. And you know, when it does, yeah. I'll be the one sitting here being like, oh man, guys, I totally updated my machine this morning Katie. for the show. <laughs> what? Well, but that's not like a <laughs> But that's a user land thing. Yeah. That was a user breakage, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, user in fact, but, every breakage I've had, but, they, has been but these things of me. tend to get looped into a big bucket of blame. Yeah. A lot of times. You're right. Yeah. You're right. So, so, you know, if what I just said sounds like lunacy to you, then Ubuntu 13.10 is perfect because it's it's current right now and it will be current enough until the next release that you'll be able to get by just yeah, fine. All your stuff's going to work like you expect. It performs better than previous yeah. releases and it's the basis of Steam OS, so it's great yeah. to be there too. Well, in a use case scenario, uh, my mom's computer, for example, if I'm going to hook her up or even, you know, for my nephew or anyone else, if I'm yeah. going to hook them up with a computer, yeah. I'm probably going to hook them up on something that's bubbleized like this. That makes sense because yeah. I don't have to worry about it. Well, and care, you know, if my you know? dad's on 1204, right? right. I, I'm... I would Why be, mess with that? I, yeah. Well, I, I, I feel like I could call up dad and say, hey, dad, do a dist upgrade. And yeah. I feel like he would reboot and he wouldn't be like shocked. He would just. That's true. Yeah. He would just pick right back up where sure. he left off. That's true. Yeah. Which is a good thing. That's a feature in a way. It is. I don't like just. I don't like the way Ubuntu does their upgrades, just because I'm a big clean install kind of guy. Oh well, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. for myself, just because I you have know, had breakage doing that. I've done a, a recent I've, breakage. Oh, you did. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I had I've a, not. You know, I had actually yeah. a System seventy six laptop that um, I I, I I had upgraded it for like three or four or five releases right. in a row before I had a problem. So yeah, it's kind of right. hit and miss. No, and that's fair. No, I'm not saying it happens often, but what it does, it sucks. PPAs yeah. add up. And then an I extra do a clean layer. install and it's fine and it doesn't matter because I yeah. did a dedicated home, so who cares? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, that's just the way I see it. I think uh, if, I think at this point, we'll see where I feel after Open Susan and Fedora have been given sure. a go. But if I was going to um, leave a rolling release like Arch or something mm-hmm. like that, my 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 big contender would be Ubuntu. Like that would be my yeah. big. Con- I, Debian would be a definite consideration for me too, uh, but I feel like um, I, I totally I totally grok a lot of what they're trying to do on Ubuntu. It's just the, it's, it's a few of the implementations that really drive me crazy. That's know? true. That's true. Well, and I've been revisiting OpenSUSE recently because I you know I still use them on occasion, and this whole rolling my own distro thing is kind of I kind of got the bug. It's you know, neat because I'm it's, it's, it's it, exactly you know. like if there's a component you don't like, it's just not there. Anymore. I can exclude the component that I don't want. I can right. also add the components I do want. Yeah. Um, I can actually customize the icons that appear on my desktop. I mean, I can. I have a lot of control, and it's uh, it's got me interested. I'm curious to see, so. you know, Cinnamon could offer um, sort of a good mix. Uh, Unity, though, I if you ha- if you if, if you haven't tried Unity for a couple of releases, you really need to try it. Like, yeah. Oh no, I would agree with that. It's um, if your big gripes with Unity were performance or things related to performance. It's totally different. Mm-hmm. If your gripe was the fact that when you disappear from the left corner and your close and minimize disappear, you're still going to be pissed off. So yeah. I'm just going to put that out there. There are a couple but, things I'm like, really? Still? That's yeah. a problem. So but, it really just depends on what about Unity you liked or didn't like. Now, in the show notes, uh, we've got more information about Juju. We've got yes. more information about the Dash search and the privacy policy that Canonical has issued on that. That's right. Uh, we've got some more of our notes in there, and we've got links to uh, information about Ubuntu 13.10 for OpenStack. Right. Uh, which uh, it's interesting that uh, OpenStack is also on a six-month release mm-hmm. cadence. So um, yes. that six-month release cadence that uh, Ubuntu enjoys is it matches that really well. And I think we'll dig more into a lot of that enterprise automation and server-side mm-hmm. stuff because yeah. that's a huge business now for Canonical. And th- they're doing, you know, I'm not saying anyone's perfect in this space, but they're doing some pretty cool stuff there. I mean, they really are, so I want to give them props for that. Yeah. You know? I-, I think uh, I think with a few... If, there is... It's interesting... In some ways, maybe it's actually 13.10 is better because they haven't been focused on it. Because it's got lower memory usage, yeah. it's, the components are faster, right. um, and it's just sort of tried and steady. It's, it's exactly They're what They're polishing what they have already, and I think that's probably the right move. If you're on 13.04, it's a slam dunk update. Yes. If you're on 12.04... You know, you gotta you gotta consider yeah. why you're on on LTS release. Yeah. Maybe you need that long long term support. But you I, might still check it out. I, I think said, you should throw it on a th- throw it on a flash drive. Take her for a spin. You yeah. know, or even you, there's even a way actually where you can uh, uh, from a CD and a flash drive where you can just install to the flash drive. You can also go that route. Mm-hmm. Um, that does work, and you that, can try that out. That said, you're a Fedora user. You're an OpenSUSE user. You're an Arch user. Yeah. There's nothing Canonical's doing here that's going to pull you away from that's those distros. True. And if you're finding there's Packages packages missing from any of those distributions, and you think you're going to find it on Ubuntu? I'd say probably check out one of the uh, either check out Arch proper or check out one of the spins. You're probably yeah. gonna better luck there. Yeah. So, so uh, there you go. I mean, it's it was definitely a challenge because um, I mean it was a little boring, but it's like boring in a good way, and you just have to yeah. keep reminding yourself. It was very that. comfortable. It's like putting on that old 
holy pair of pajamas that you know <laughs> had with the air conditioning built in. It was really comfortable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had I had I did have some you know it's like oh yeah that is nice like it is you get up and going very yeah. fast you know and also just a quick uh, plug we dug into. Um, some of the mental exercises we went through to prepare ourselves to this review yes. in episode nine of Linux Unplugged. So go check out the Ubuntu situation right. uh, where we kind of debate, is the traditional release model perhaps becoming antiquated? Mm. And also, if there really is a spot in the Linux ecosystem for the XP of Linux, in a sense. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I mean that in a steady, people can target it, it's wide yeah. di distribution in the enterprise, things mm. like that. People get comfortable with it, Exactly. Um, so I thought it was a great Linux Unplugged episode nine. It aired on Tuesday of last week. And so if you uh, want more insights into our review this week, you'll catch them there. That's right. Good stuff. All right, Matt. That's the Linux Action Show's look at Ubuntu 13.10. Uh, that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Hey, Matt. Yes. Before we get out of here, I want to cover an email. Okay. And uh, we got a whole bunch. Actually, Linux Unplugged generated a ton, so we're going to be covering, nice. I think we're going to have a real email-heavy uh, episode of Linux Unplugged oh, on yeah. Tuesday. But Dakota wrote in um, about Leadworks, or Leadworks. He says, hi, I was wondering if you could talk about Leadworks on last. Leadworks is a commercial game engine that is being brought over to Linux, but it's not just being ported. They're actually rewriting it from the ground up wow. for Linux. So um, That's really cool. You know, uh, Unity is probably the one we talk about the most. Yeah, as that's far the one I'm most familiar with. Yeah. yeah, this is kind of like uh, so. Leadworks is kind of like that same thing. Uh, it is a uh, it's a 3D game engine uh, powered by OpenGL 2.1. Mm -hmm. The engine makes use of the Newton Game Dynamics SDK for physics, and it uses OpenAL for audio, and mm. uh, it uses like I mentioned OpenGL for the 3D. The engine is based on deferred render as Leadworks 2.1. The unified lighting system allows for dynamic lighting and soft wow. shadowing without the use of light maps or any pre-compilation. Ooh. Modules have been made by members of the community to allow the use of the engine in languages such as Java, C Sharp, VB.net, wow. Python, C++, and others. Lua is also in there. Uh, mm -hmm. And it costs about $200 per user to make an app. And then you can make an app kind of like Unity for the mobiles or for the desktops. Right yeah, now it's Windows. I think for what you're getting, that's pretty good. And they're bringing it over to Linux. I like that. It's going to be uh, mm -hmm. uh, another source. So this is like one of those things where like Unity comes along, not the desktop, but mm -hmm. the gaming and Unity 3D comes along. And you see an explosion of Linux games when they right. add published to Linux Which support. Is cool. Now we're going to see the same thing here. It's like all these different tool sets that folks are using are building in Linux support. I think Valve definitely provided that a uh, pinnacle of uh, something to follow. Yeah, yeah, it's a good example to follow. Yes. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks for sending that in, Dakota, and uh, all of you other guys that send in emails. We'll get to those and unplug. We're also. I didn't get a chance to do the, the bit message this week because I was running Ubuntu and bit messages installed under my Arch mm -hmm. installation, but we'll get to those too. Yep. Um, all right, very good. And there's also an, a bonus email in there about desktop environments that I figured since we're running a little long today, we won't get to, but sure. uh, he bemoans, uh, Lars bemoaned uh, the state of desktops right now. He's trying out 1304. Uh, yeah. He was wondering about 1310. So Lars, try out 1310 and yeah. let us know what you yeah, think. Just give it a whirl. You know, Matt, before we run, I wanted to remind folks that there's a way that everybody out there can help keep these types of shows on the air. That's right. This is, an ind this is independent media, and a huge portion of our financing comes directly from you guys. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a very straightforward way to do that. We have direct donation links on the side of the Jupiter Broadcasting website. You can even sign up for a $7 a month if you want to lock in your support for our network. If you scroll down to the bottom of our website, we have links down there for our affiliates like Amazon and Newegg and ThinkGeek and Best Buy. If you click there before you shop then a portion of your shopping session is tagged and contributed to Jupyter Broadcasting. And we also have browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. If you install those, then your session's automatically tagged when you visit those sites, including other sites that aren't listed like Woot.com, Monoprice, and, and other iterations like outside the country, like Amazon DECA, Newegg CA. Those are all in the yeah. extension that aren't necessarily linked at the bottom of our website. And these are open source extensions, too. You I got think. it, Matt. Yep. You got it. They're up on GitHub if folks want to check out the source. Yeah. Uh, we've had folks out there that have implemented it for their own podcast and for their churches and stuff like that, too. That's cool. Yeah. It's a really neat kind of way to help support the network and doesn't cost you anything. You just get yourself Can't something while you're, while you're getting us something. A nice arrangement. Matt, anything yeah. you want to point folks to while you're uh, around this uh, week? A few things that I may be coming up with uh, here in the coming week. So if you want to stay tuned in that, uh, catch me on Google+, Plus, which the link's in the show notes. And then, of course, on Facebook, Matt Hartley Public. And, of course, on Linux Unplugged on Tuesdays. That's right. I'm here every Tuesday. We're going to have a heavy feedback episode, yes. me thinks. Uh, same with me. You can find my social profiles over on uh, the uh, show notes. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Mm -hmm. Find this episode of Linux Action Show. Scroll down towards the bottom. That's where we have all that stuff. And one more plug for that calendar. We'd love to have you join us live. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, and you'll see all of our live shows laid out there. That's right. And uh, it automatically converts it to your local time zone. So, oh, 
Oh, I should probably give a plug too for our BitTorrent. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. You know, we make these shows available via BitTorrent, and uh, our our bandwidth usage is like astronomical these days, which sure. is great. Good problem to have. Good problem to have. Great yeah. problem to have. But you can help us sort of alleviate some of that bandwidth usage by utilizing the torrents for this show. Um, we have an HD torrent that is available immediately at the release of the Linux Action Show linked. And then we have feeds for the mobile version and the web M version. Mm-hmm. Those usually come on a little bit later as the feeds update. But you know, if you don't download Sunday night, if you can wait maybe like till the next day, those feeds are great for you because then you can get web M, which right. is one of the few ways we make web M available is via the torrents. So, and uh, for those of you that don't know, we also are on Roku now. Oh yeah, I mean, and I think that's something we need to plug more because You're that's right. on your TV set. Roku is is awesome. Yeah, yeah, and you can watch live on the Roku or you can watch the back catalog. There is a Jupiter Broadcasting Roku app. Good call, Matt. Yeah, you can either Good search call. for it or you can browse to, I believe it's Internet TV under the categories, and then just scroll down. And yeah, we might have a, uh, we have a, a direct link somewhere, but you know. Yeah, we probably. But have you can a, browse for us easy enough. Yeah, you can search Jupiter for Jupiter Broadcasting. We also give a give a search for Jupiter Broadcasting in the Google Play Store. There's a couple yeah. of apps in there you can listen live and check the back sure. catalog out on your Android device. That's right. On the go. Yep, very nice. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Let me tell you about poop. Let me tell you about poop, Matt. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, Matt. Hey, uh, hey Matt. Um, uh, apple bottom jeans, jeans, boots with the fur, the furs. Look, right here, Matt. In 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 Canonical's uh, terms of use, they say right here, to authenticate certain features of our websites, to provide services and products, to contact you or to respond t- to notices regarding your use of our website, mm-hmm. To comply with legal and regulatory requirements, including responsibility to court orders, subpoenas, and prevent crime, yep. these special circumstances may require us to disclose personal information. Yep. To contact you if your actions violate an agreement with us. To study how anonymous users act with our website and to market and product services at you. Yeah. No. I mean, there's no question. Like I said, I put I, that on my desktop, please. I want <laughs> that right now. <laughs> yeah. And I said, so I, I agree. So we agree on the don't friggin' use that feature or avoid it. However, you need to avoid it. Just don't don't play that game. And I definitely consider that key logging. I, I, there's no argument there. I, I just, consider it creepy. Oh, yeah, and creepy too. And I just, you know, spyware. I, it's kind of like if, if I, Apple, you know, if it came out, spyware, if it came out that every you know. search term that you know in uh, on the iPhone you can uh, you can search yeah. for apps and stuff. Um, it, uh, if it came out that every time you type into that, and maybe it does, maybe it does. I was say, Apple. and it doesn't. Maybe it does. But <laughs> if it came out, people would flip their s. They would freak the s out. It would be the number one story in tech news. It'd probably even make it to the mainstream news. It would be yeah. a huge deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, look how people reacted when they store a hash of an encrypted fingerprint on the CPU. People freaked the sh- their s out. Yeah. And so, the fact that we just let Canonical do this, it, it they are not in a position of strength because they're a small company. That makes them more susceptible to strong arming by legal authorities. Oh, that yeah. makes them more of a target. That makes them more likely to get rolled over. Yep. That makes them. That makes it worse. It is more egregious because they are a small company. They cannot afford to fight it. That's right. Uh, what world do we live in where this is okay? This next demo is a game called Papers, Please. It's a predominantly mouse-driven game, and so we can use both trackpads to control the mouse alternately. Now, look um, at this accuracy the here. two mouse movements get blended together so I can move with my left thumb and then my right thumb, oh. and it allows you to do a really quick walk across the screen. Oh. It's a very comfortable way to control games that need to move the mouse very precisely and yet over large distances of the screen. Oh. 